Well, we are at one o three. Um, I think I think we should maybe get started. Does that sound good? Great. I can only see Sophie's face, and I'm getting a thumbs up, so I'm going to take that as a go ahead. <laughs> Um, cool. So I am Rebecca Roman. My pronouns are she, her. I work at the Vermont Land Trust. Um, and so just a little bit of orienting here. Uh, if you are tuning in from a computer, uh, if you move your mouse around on your screen at the bottom, you'll see a little tab that says participants, chat, uh, share screen, or I don't know what you'll see, but you'll see <laughs> the chat and the Q&A, definitely. Uh, and those functions are the most important function for you. Um, the chat, uh, I so appreciate that everyone's been sharing where they're tuning in from. Uh, we'll only be using that a couple of times uh, throughout the webinar whenever you're prompted. Um, otherwise, please put your questions in the little Q&A portion. Um, and if you click on that, you can you can type it in, and that way we'll be able to get to each of your questions and make sure we like keep track of them really well, because uh, otherwise they might get lost in the chat. Um, yeah, and great, we will will dive in now. Um, so before we get super into the webinar, I just want us to do. A playful little grounding and arriving activity together. Um, you'll see on your screen this beautiful view of some woodlands in Vermont. Uh, and that's there to help you like call a place into your mind. Um, so if you will with me, close your mind, close your eyes, uh, and you can hold that picture in your mind or imagine your favorite woods in Burlington or elsewhere. Uh, for me, I'm I'm imagining the Intervale Center uh, and walking along the trail that runs next to the Winooski River. And it's mud season now, so as you're looking around, you see little paw prints and thawing scat on the ground. Perhaps you hear the birds above you, a welcoming sound from the silence of winter. You notice that the buds on the trees are bursting forth, ready to explode with new growth. And if you're also in the interval, maybe you're hearing and seeing the bustle of activity on the farms and community gardens. Take a deep breath with me. Inhale. And let it all out. This place that we call Vermont and its people are bursting out of hibernation as it does every year and as it has for thousands of years. Now that we've arrived in this place and keeping your eyes closed, still being in that, in that moment and in that place, I invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the history of the land you're on and the deep connections that people have had with it throughout history. To acknowledge the Abenaki peoples who have been in community with the land here for hundreds of generations and who continue to live and work here. To acknowledge the past, the present, and the future of our place as humans to be part of nature and to give back to it. Now you can open your eyes. And if you're tuning in from outside of Vermont, um, I would like to share a link with you in the chat to see whose land you're on. Uh, who's in, who are the indigenous peoples of the land that you're tuning in from? And in addition to that, I want to share another link with you um, where you can donate money uh, to an organization that's really focused on enhancing BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and persons of colors, persons of color connection to land and uh, financially supporting their access to land. Um, so both of those are now in the chat and they will be on a resource that we will share with you afterward. Thank you all for arriving to this webinar and showing up and grounding in this place. Um, and I hope you keep that place centered in your heart and in your mind as we learn about our wild neighbors moving through the Burlington urban landscape. Hi, so my name is Alicia Daniel and uh, I have uh, many hats that I wear in the city of Burlington. Um, I am the uh, field naturalist for Burlington Parks, Recreation and Waterfront. I also 
um, serve on the Burlington Wildways Steering Committee. And I teach at the UVM Field Naturalist Program. And I am the executive director of Vermont Master Naturalists. And I'm really delighted to see so many Master Naturalists signed on today. So thank, thank you for attending. Um, I started tracking really to write this report that's in front of you. Um, that was really the reason that I began tracking in Burlington. I had be, been hired by Winooski Valley Park District. Um, Jennifer Ely um, found me a job and I was, our first thought was we really need to know how animals are moving through Burlington. You know, I was kind of a habitat specialist for them and we tried to uh, find out you know, what was going on in the city. And I, I, very early on, so this was in the year 2000, we started to discover several things. Uh, Burlington has a lot of different wild animals in it. And, and this report, the, one of the best things it did was it gave rise to the Burlington Mammal Tracking Project several years later. And, and we went from like 50 sightings that we had managed to document in this report by going out after storms, using paper forms, boots on the ground, detective work, um, Sophie quickly expanded that number up to over, I don't know, 700 and 1,000. And now Lena, with some of her work down in the intervale, is, is just quantum leaping that forward. So we're learning a lot about what's going on in Burlington. It kind of started in a rustic way, um, and it's really grown from there. And I'm really excited about that. Um, one thing I couldn't have, wouldn't have seen there and wouldn't have imagined are the technological changes that have come into this field, um, all fields really, because when this report was published, Amazon was still a river. And uh, it now, it's five years later, was trademark named, you know, to be the behemoth online seller that we know today. So I was really, it struck me when I went out, I would never have imagined this then, and it even surprised me now, Lena, that I found this report for sale on Amazon, Jeff Bezos is willing to sell me my own report um, if if he can find it, which I'm pretty confident he he won't be able to. But it's just sort of funny to think how far things have come and how much they've changed in the last 20 years. So Lena. So that's kind of how I come to be sitting on this panel. But the reason that I'm a tracker really has more to do with the fact that I just love wild animals. And I'm sure that Many of you joining us today feel the same way. Whenever a wild animal crosses my path, I feel just touched by grace. It's just such an amazing experience for me. And in, in many ways, um, as a scientist, I'm, 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 I'm always pleased when science shows us something that we already know in our heart, Lena. And that for me is this diagram, which is a phenology, a, a phenology of our family, phylog phylogeny of our family. This is our family tree. And we all started out, we all started out, all life started out as single cell bacteria in an ancient ocean. And it's radiated out into all this beautiful diversity of life. And I just feel so humbled by that and amazed by that. And it just touches my heart every day how much life we share the planet with, Lena. So if you love wildlife, Burlington is actually a really good city to live in. And I, I've asked myself many times why that is. And I think there are really two key elements that make Burlington wild. One is water and the other is sand. Um, so when you think about water, we have the Winooski River flowing along our eastern to northern boundary. You know, it, it hugs us on, our, on that side of the city. And the lake shore hugs us on the other side. And this, these dots that are on this landscape are all different animals that have been um, tracked and mapped in the city. And you can see that there's a real affinity, of course, for the green spaces, for the wild heart of the city, which is the Rock Point Armed Forest Inter Intervale area, out um, Ethan Allen Homestead. But there's also a clear affinity of certain animals for the water itself. And so otter and mink, and beavers, you know, they live in and around water. Um, other animals though, like bobcat will trail through the city. They run, the a river runs through the city. The, the bobcats move through the city along the Winooski River often, although we have an exciting later film of them that 
shows they don't stay completely faithful to that watery corridor, Lena. But another thing about Burlington is that uh, as the Champlain Sea was receding across our landscape, um, as you know, that um, saltwater arm of the Atlantic Ocean, we were just sort of a bay of the Atlantic Ocean about 9,000 years ago, and it dropped slowly across Burlington. And during that time, a much more wild Winooski River was dumping sand over the city in a giant delta. It's the airport, it's the north end of Burlington, it's Centennial Woods, which is what we're looking at now. And the thing about sand is it erodes easily. And so as water runs through sand, it cuts these crevices and we end up with this very furrowed landscape, which is a great thing for animals. It gives them lots of places to hide and of course places to drink and for mink and otter and um, beaver, places to find food. Um, so I think that those are two really amazing things about the Burlington landscape. Lena. So before I turn you over to Sophie and I'm really excited to do that. We're kind of going through this talk chronologically uh, from, from beginning to present. But um, I wanted to tell you two quick stories. One was uh, in this year of, of a pandemic, exactly almost a year ago, my daughter was sent home abruptly from college and it was hard for her. It was so to keep our spirits up, we tried to come up with things to do. And we knew from Intel that there was a fox den up the hill from us. And actually, red foxes especially live all over Burlington. They're very adaptable. They love sand. It's great to burrow in. It's just a, a good match of animal with habitat. And they're not as skittish, as shy as gray fox. Um, so there are dens around. And we had one in this crazy place right by the road, just up the hill from my house in Burlington South End. So we would go in the evening, as the sun was setting, we'd go on a fox safari. And we'd go up the hill, and at the very least, we got to see a beautiful sunset. But often, we also saw these young foxes. And it was so healing. It was so amazing. It was just such a wonderful way to spend those early weeks of the pandemic when everyone, I think, was feeling pretty scared and anxious. Um, although I will say that as the fox kits got older and began to cross the road to follow the mother, <laughs> it became a less relaxing thing to encounter them, we started to fear for their lives, which is something to consider, you know, when you live in a city, is what does it mean to be a wild animal in a city? So I'd like to show you one more video, um, or a video before I, I turn it over to Sophie. So Lena, if we could cut to that last thing. Um, this is in Centennial Woods. I'm gonna give that away. And it was uh, filmed in the fall. I didn't see this. Um, I have to thank Keegan O'Connor, who's a naturalist and founder of Crow's Path here in Burlington, for putting this camera out um, near a deer carcass in Centennial Woods. And I'm just curious if you want to put something in the chat. What do you think about this bobcat family feeding, you know, less than a couple of miles from my house? I don't know how close they are to you. But here they are, the mother and a couple of younger um, teenagers, I'd say, you know, eating uh, this carcass. And I'm going to just let you watch it in silence for a minute and just tell me what your first response to sort of understanding that this is going on in the city is. And if you could put that in the chat. <laughs> Someone said, wow, it just blows my mind. Yeah, awesome. We need to protect open space. I didn't know bobcats lived here until a few weeks ago. It's great, isn't it? It's amazing. I'm happy to live so close to nature. These are all the kind of reactions I had to this as well. Um, you know, I thought, wow, I live in a wild place. It's cool that the mother's sort of hiding the carcass there. Uh, that's typical bobcat behavior. Doesn't want everything else to eat it before they're done with it.
there's a question about whether they would take down a deer. And I think I'll let Sophie field that question, but the, the short answer is yes, but we don't know. I don't know at least how this one died. Do you, did we find that out? So no, we don't know. We can, we can try to figure that out though for later. So we're through with that um, film and you know, my reaction to it was what many of you had. I was just like, man, I live in a wild place. I live in a bobcat city. You know, in, among wildlife biologists, people talk about you can live in a bear city, a bobcat city, or a squirrel city. And we still have bobcat status, and that feels really important to me. Um, and it was fun to see it verified here. Teague's reaction was a little different than mine. His was, wow, animals are so adaptable. You know, they really do figure out how to make their way in crazy places. So um, those were two things that we thought um, watching this. So I am gonna turn it over to Sophie. Sophie and I have known each other for many, many years. And be before I quite let it go, I will say that Sophie is a tracker. Um, trackers among, even among naturalists have a certain mystique. Um, people don't casually call themselves trackers. Um, and, and I guess I would like to soften that a little bit. I would like to encourage you all to track. And I would say, you know, if you knit, you're a knitter. And if you track, you're a tracker. You know, maybe you're not at the point that you want to be teaching or, or marketing yourself, but it's certainly available to you and it's, it's great fun to do. Um, so I'll, I'll, I will let Sophie carry on from here. And I'll just say that, that Sophie, um, you're one of my favorite people to be out in the woods with studying anything but I do love being out there with you as a tracker. <laughs> oh, thanks, Alicia. Yeah, the, the feeling is totally mutual. Um, and I was first lucky enough to meet Alicia when I came to Vermont from Ontario, Canada to study in the field naturalist program. And uh, I'm just so grateful that Alicia has expanded uh, those same lessons that she taught us in that graduate program to the public, right? To members of a lot of communities around the state through the Vermont Master Naturalist Program so that uh, she's basically training uh, groups of land stewards in, in all different communities and uh, sharing the gift of being able to read the landscape. So uh, yeah, I am a tracker, uh, but I would, I would totally extend that title to, to anyone willing to take it. If we go far back enough in our lineages, you all come from a lineage of trackers. And, uh, and we are naturally adapted uh, to be able to pay attention to the landscape, to notice subtle visual cues. And maybe you don't currently track wildlife, but you track weather patterns or you track the movement of your significant other across the house <laughs> following the sound or the signs that they leave behind. Um, but it, I love nothing more than, than applying those skills of observation and storytelling to the world of wildlife. So if you move to the next slide, Lena. I want to share with you a set of tracks that I found in, in my backwoods near the mouth of Potash Brook where it spills into Shelburne Bay. And I, I was so excited to find these tracks and also puzzled by them back in 2015 because it was my early days of taking a deep dive into studying tracking. And so I remember uh, bringing Alicia to that location and, and sharing them with her. And you can see there's two photos on the screen. Uh, the left-hand one shows at least five individual tracks. There's actually a couple of species represented there if you look closely enough. Uh, but there's one large one. These you know, big tracks were four inches long. And I, I noticed a, a splay of teardrop shaped toes. And uh, noticing that if I looked closely, I could identify five toes on, on all the front and hind tracks. I was looking at a member of the weasel family. And so there's a couple of members of the weasel family uh, or you know, several large ones that you can find uh, in Burlington, but River Otter and Fisher were the two options that came to mind looking at these tracks. And uh, the, the shape and, and the prominence of the toes here is, is one of the clues that gives these away as otter, but in searching the, the softer sand uh, at a nearby location along this shoreline of Potash Brook, I did find the example that you see in the right-hand photo of these tracks displaying a bit of the webbing on the feet of otter. Uh, so that was one of the really good giveaways that that's who we were looking at here. And I just remember being totally entranced because I, I don't think I'd seen otter in Burlington at this point. Uh, I'd definitely seen from Alicia's Where the Wild Things Are report uh, that they were represented there. And I'd heard stories that uh, 
Perkins Pier in that area especially can be quite busy with otter that like to come and leave their scent marks uh, up on the docks there. And so I knew them to frequent the Lake Champlain shoreline, but I had no idea that they'd be in my backwoods stream uh, in what felt like a much more forested area uh, in South Burlington. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, that was really one of the sightings that, that initiated a conversation with Alicia about reviving the study of wildlife in Burlington. And, and as a student, I was actually apprenticing in a, a tracking program and I was looking for a project to do. And so Alicia suggested that uh, we reinitiate, reinitiate the Burlington uh, tracking efforts, you know, recruiting members of the public to go out and survey for wildlife around the city or report their sightings. And since it was 2015 rather than the year 2000, uh, there is just this wonderful technology available, right? Everyone had or nearly everyone a smartphone in their pocket with a built-in GPS unit where you could log a sighting and mark the location of where you found mink tracks or where you saw a fox in your backyard. And then this really great tool called iNaturalist, which I expect several people in the audience will be familiar with. Uh, but if you don't know it, iNaturalist.org, anybody can go and create a free account and upload photos of wildlife, wildlife tracks, any wildlife sign. And not just for mammals, right? We're talking plants and mollusks and invertebrates, uh, you name it. And there's a wonderful community of naturalists on there uh, that are engaging in different projects to try to, to gather data and understand what's present on their landscape. So one thing that really drew me to a naturalist was that there are a lot of wildlife trackers on there that are eager to confirm observations that you put on. And I created a project on that platform called the Burlington Mammal Tracking Project, uh, where people could sign on and specifically submit sightings to our Greater Burlington Area Wildlife Sightings Map. So next slide. As part of, the, as part of these efforts, I was interested in finding track and sign, but also placing trail cameras out on the landscape to capture footage like this. This video may be coming through a little choppily because uh, it's a large video file. I'll do my best to share a link to a version of some of this footage. These are otters doing what I like to call the poop dance. It turns out I talk about poop and scat a lot as a tracker. But you'll notice in the third segment, just lots of rolling behavior too. And uh, so I, I set this camera up at, at a really busy area. Looking at the next slide, I'll show you what was the clue that uh, that clued me into wanting to set up a trail camera here, right? So, you know, trail cameras that are activated by the motion and heat of an animal can help reveal where animals are in the landscape, but you can also use your ability to read track and sign to pick out the locations where you want to observe. And otters weren't the only animals that passed by this particular South Burlington location. There is also deer, coyote, interestingly gray fox, but not red fox, uh, raccoons, cardinals, robins, and several other species. But the reason I'd set it up here was because I'd recognized uh, what's kind of like an otter billboard here. I know we don't have a lot of billboards, if any, even in Vermont, but uh, just as humans tend to set up their billboards at busy road intersections where lots of people are passing by, otter like to leave their territorial markings, their sign in, in busy areas, which could be at the mouth of a stream, uh, maybe the narrow isthmus of a peninsula that they actually cross over to get from one stretch of river to another, or uh, outside of den sites also. And this was near an area where they may have been founding some shelter and, and denning at this particular spot. And so this whole sequence of otters is coming through and leaving their scats. And then also you can see these mucousy scat jellies, the lining of their digestive tract that also comes out. And so several different otters were, were coming through and leaving that sign here. We'll move on to the next slide. So uh, next slide, Lena. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Here we have a close up. There's probably just a little bit of a delay on my end. So here's a close up of just what one of those scats can look like. Sometimes you'll just find them uh, individually or, or maybe just in a small grouping on the land too. So you can also recognize uh, this is otter. Otters have really loose scats that uh, as they weather and disintegrate reveal the contents of their aquatic foraging. And so you can see, I don't know all my different little uh, fish, but you can see little fish bones all throughout this scat that I think Alicia was there when we found this one in Centennial Woods on a, a tracking club outing. 
All right, so moving on to the next slide. So I, I became really curious about how all of these large mammals were managing to make their way in and around Burlington. So, you know, in the case of otters following water courses, but then some of the observations also uh, drew a lot of questions and mysteries in my mind, because as you can see here, here's a representation of part of the south end of Burlington. You can see actually the black line is the Burlington South Burlington boundary. Uh, a lot of people don't actually realize exactly where that line is. The wildlife certainly doesn't. And you can see a bunch of different large mammals represented here with those colored uh, pointers and the otters are the dark blue asterisks. So near Red Rocks uh, in the private lands along the, uh, the most downstream stretch of Potash Brook, you can see lots of sightings of otter. And not to say that that's the most dense otter area, a, a, in some ways, these points represent where people have been spending time tracking in addition to just where the wildlife is. So the fact that there isn't a, a point marked in a certain place doesn't mean that wildlife isn't there. It could just be that it hasn't been identified there yet. Uh, but there's been a pretty good survey and study over the past several years. So we're definitely starting to, to paint a picture of those activity areas and hotspots. But you may notice that in addition to along the mouth of Potash Brook, there's another otter observation point pretty far upstream and that's uh, in the East Woods area. So moving on to the next slide, I wanna show you what the landscape looks like between those two locations where, uh, where we've reported otters or where I found otter tracks on the map. And if you hit next again, uh, Lena, it's gonna paint where Potash Brook flows uh, between those locations. Now, if you spend time around the South End or if you uh, connected from 189 onto Shelburne Road, you may recognize this as that intersection. So this is one of the busiest intersections in Vermont, uh, near the cluster of Price Chopper and Hannaford's and uh, Shaw's, right? The big grocery store cluster. Not something, I, a place I tend to think of as wildlife habitat. And notice that if an otter were starting in Shelburne Bay, in Lake Champlain and at the mouth of Potash Brook, they'd be starting to the left of this image. And to move upstream, they'd have to travel underneath Queen City Park Road and that defunct extension of 189 mm. alongside it through an uh, like an impounded uh, kind of not quite culvert right but like open culvert it's not really like the natural flowage of the stream but then make it underneath Shelburne Road where Potash Brook goes underground for a good long stretch before popping up the other side uh, and then into East Woods and so I've actually seen we, Anybody passing through here may have noticed sometimes roadkill along the roadway there that animals certainly try to make that journey and I'm not sure that otters were successful or if they might have actually come from a different location. So I'll move to the next slide and zoom out and take a wider view of uh, the Burlington and South Burlington area. And you may notice, and I think Alicia flashed this on the screen earlier too, that there's a cluster of otter sightings at the mouth of Muddy Brook along the Minooski River, and they're known to travel that. So otter territories tend to be measured in terms of linear miles of shoreline, and like 15 to 30 miles would be an average otter territory. And so that sighting in Eastwoods rose the question of, well, are otters actually managing to navigate underneath Shelburne Road or across it, whether through the culvert or on top of the road? Or could they actually be going upstream along Muddy Brook and then maybe crossing over into the Potash Brook corridor somewhere around the neighborhood of the whale tails, which I know is a lot more developed now than it's showing up on the screen here, the open field there. Uh, but that would be one location where they'd be able to hop from one drainage into another. So, uh, so some of these tracking studies uh, have been you know, bringing up lots of mysteries, unsolved mysteries still, and there's still so much more to know and gather uh, about this wildlife. But what's really wonderful is that in looking for track and sign and setting out trail cameras, we can do it in a non-invasive way, right? So I don't need to necessarily put a tracking radio collar or GPS collar on an animal to follow its every move, although that would of course give us a lot more information, uh, but we can find it by following their trails too. So I just wanna quickly share about one other species, a relative of the otter, so we'll move to the next slide and say hello to the fisher, which is an animal that has I would say an unfairly bad reputation in a lot of circles. These are five to at most 18 pound creatures, right? So think house cat sized that uh, in the Burlington area spend a lot of time chasing after squirrels and cottontails. And in this case, this fisher might've been digging around looking for a vole in this area here, also near Potash Brook. And uh, let's move to the next slide. These fishers are 
also ranging across big areas of the city. So their territories are an average in the Northeast about seven square miles. And what's great about Fisher is that they spend far more time on land than otters. And so you can follow their trails over great long stretches of distance. And this almost looks like squirrel tracks going across the snow, but as you can see in the right-hand picture here, uh, each of those little plops in the snow is where both the front feet and then the hind feet have landed right on top of those, leaving this two by two kind of pattern of great big five-toed tracks. So let's look at the next slide of uh, where Fisher are ranging across the land. Oh, and, and sometimes actually they're leaving really dramatic and, and wonderful signs like this one. So this is actually a marking. Maybe you can make out the outline of a Fisher's body where it's jumped down from a tree and left four footprints up near the top left, but also the outline of its tail and its head. Because these animals, if you ever lose a Fisher trail, I usually go to the nearest large tree and look to see if I can pick up on the tracks down below because they're quite agile tree climbers and they'll den up in the treetops as well as search for prey up there. So now let's move on to the next slide and we'll take a look at where Fisher are ranging across the Burlington area. And they're represented by the yellow stars here on the map. And this is certainly not every sighting of a fisher in Burlington, but some of the key sightings. But if you click again later, one thing I wanted to point out is that these maps are showing individual sightings, but embedded behind some of that are these stories of the trails that connect those individual sightings. And so when I am looking for wildlife sightings for this project, I'm particularly excited to know when an animal crosses the road and especially when they're using little connecting pieces of habitat between their larger patches. Because notice that this squiggly line represents several days of travel of fishers that I tracked around Red Rocks where they're known to be denning now. But notice that the animal or one of these fishers crossed uh, Central Avenue really close to the parking lot or like right through the parking lot for Red Rocks. And then also continued up this really thin strip of land kind of across the street from from Burton uh, and near the Red Rocks condos and then uh, you know, crossed another road to connect all the way up to Oak Ledge. So maybe you recognize if you're familiar with this area, this fisher managed to basically sneak through little backyards, little tiny patches of land that we don't tend to think of as conserved habitat or, or maybe very wild habitat uh, and make their way into the forest, sticking to forest cover most of the time, right? Just making quick dashes across roads to get back into that cover and uh, connecting and, and maybe piecing together enough of a territory to get somewhere close to that seven square miles that a fisher might typically use in the Northeast, or maybe finding enough of a density of, of rabbits and squirrels that uh, just a couple of square miles might be enough in Burlington, South Burlington. So on the last slide, uh, Lena, I just wanna share a, another picture of what wildlife habitat can look like. So uh, there's the Burton building on the left. This is like the Google street view. And you can see this is where Queen City Park Road meets Central Avenue. This is the final turn you'd take to go park and go visit the 100 acres of Red Rocks Park. But very significantly for wildlife in Burlington, the patch of woods that's pretty much in the middle of this frame uh, with those three aspen trunks, that little patch of woods next to the, the power substation, you can see how thin the trees are on the right hand side, is a corridor for fisher, for foxes, for deer uh, moving into red rocks. And so these, these little patches of what I like to call forgotten forest can be vitally important pieces of the wildlife habitat puzzle in Burlington and a way for these animals to find enough habitat amidst all the other great large habitat blocks that we have, uh, but which you know any one of them alone may not be enough for our largest species in the city. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lena Swizlaki, who's been studying very carefully one of those large habitat patches in particular. And I think Lena's gonna share how we first met, but she first came on uh, looking to contribute to the Burlington Mammal Tracking Project some years ago. Great, thanks, Sophie. Um, my name is Lena Swislocki. I am the Land Stewardship Research Associate at the Interrail Center. Um, and I am gonna talk a little bit today about a game camera study that we're just finishing up. Um, before I dive into it though, Sophie's right, I'm gonna talk about how I got involved. Um, and on December 5th, 2018, I saw this post come up in my front porch forum about a talk that was happening the following day on December 6th by someone named Sophie who was gonna talk about wildlife tracking 
in Burlington. Um, I thought it sounded pretty cool. I wanted to go. None of my friends wanted to go. So I went alone and I was completely starstruck. Um, you know, the talk that Sophie just gave is just the tip of the iceberg of her knowledge. And I was so impressed and I just wanted to be exactly like her. Uh, and so I followed her around and I went tracking with her as often as she would let me. And over the course of one of those tracking walks, uh, the topic came up of Vermont master naturalists, which Alicia mentioned before. Um, you'll see Alicia is there on the on the right side of the image holding a part of that map. Um, and I thought that sounded like fun. And so I signed up and learned an amazing amount about the ecology and the natural history of the Burlington area. Um, and I met some really cool people, including a professor at St. Mike's who was doing a game camera study and said that he maybe wanted some help uh, you know, placing cameras, sure, I'll help out, um, which turned out to be a much bigger undertaking than I expected. Uh, this is a list of all of the supporting agencies, especially the Intervale Center and St. Mike's College. Um, there are a lot of people involved, a lot of people with a lot of questions about what animals live in this area and what they're doing. So Professor McCabe lent us 25 cameras. You can see an image of what our cameras look like. Um, they're locked to trees. They are motion and heat activated. And we had them set to take five photos each time the camera was triggered. So we had 25 cameras out over about six months and wound up with over 300,000 photos. Um, it's an amazing cache of information. This slide is another map of the Burlington area. The red line that you can see is the Lower Winooski River Valley project, project area. Um, and the game camera study was largely done as part of that information gathering project. You can tell from the numbered points that we did have some cameras outside the project area. Just out of curiosity, there's a culvert there that goes under 89 where it says 17, five and 21. So we were wondering if animals were using that to get under the highway. But today we're specifically gonna talk about four, excuse me, about three locations that are circled here, Pine Island, Sunderland Brook and the Intervale Center. And I picked those locations because they're very close to each other but they all have something special. Um, so the Intervale is pretty big and it has public access and farming and hiking and it has been in sort of restoration uh, for about 25 years. Pine Island, which is owned by Vermont Land Trust, one of the hosts of today's event, um, is much newer. It's only been under restoration for about eight years. Um, and there's public access, but not really very much hiking. They do allow hunting and there's a lot of farming. And then Sunderland Brook um, has this special feature of having Sunderland Brook running through the landscape. Um, and it has been owned by the same family for quite some time and has been in active restoration, I would say for over 30 years. Uh, so let's look at these sites individually. We're gonna start with the Intervale, um, 360 acres of farmland, trails and open space established in its current iteration in 1988. You can see images here of the farm and the Winooski River that borders actually all of these sites. Uh, and it's just, you know, the Intervale is gorgeous. So what did we find? A lot of squirrels. We found a lot of squirrels at the Intervale. Sophie, maybe we can encourage one of those fishers to head over there for a nice buffet. Um, other than squirrels, we found, uh, you know, maybe 10 species, not as many deer as I expected, a lot more coyotes than I expected. And the best image of the hundreds that we got from the Intervale, I would say, is this one, which is a coyote lurking in the bushes um, kind of near the conservation nursery. And I had a friend who worked at the nursery who swore up and down that she saw coyotes all the time, but that no one believed her that she saw them. So I was very gratified to get this photo and prove her right, that there are coyotes at the Intervale. Moving on to Pine Island. Um, Pine Island is immediately across the river from the Intervale. It's 230 acres. There's farm businesses, there's community gardens. Um, Vermont Land Trust bought it in 2013. I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to go to Pine Island in early January and feed your Christmas trees to the goats, but it's super fun. Strongly recommend if you have not had the chance to do it. Um, so you can sort of see from these photos kind of what the what Pine Island looks like. 
what did we see there? We saw a ton of raccoons. Um, and, you know, some skunks, some deer, some possums, a lot of squirrels. We saw an otter. Our best photo from Pine Island is this bobcat, who we actually caught coming and going, but I just love his facial expression, or her, I don't know. I love this cat's facial expression in this photo. Uh, moving on to Sunderland Brook. Sunderland Brook is also called Cottonwood Stables. It's over two, it's about 200 acres. It borders the Winooski just south of Pine Island. It's been owned by the same family, the Senesacs, since the 1920s. Um, and they were gracious enough to let us put three cameras along the stream that runs through the property. It's currently used as a horse training and boarding facility and they grow crops on site to feed primarily to the horses. Um, so you can see a picture of the cornfield with a very cute dog and a dude, my dude, uh, and then the stream and the Winooski River. Um, so what did we find at Sunderland Brook? We found almost 700 raccoons and a bunch of squirrels and some rodents and some otters and opossums and an incredible diversity of species. Um, far Ruth, and away. Yeah. Can you just tell us what MVR stands for? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it stands for uh, mouse, vole, or rodent otherwise not specified. Um, they're really hard to tell apart in in photos, so I wanted to count them, but I didn't want to say for certain that it was a mouse or a vole because I wasn't sure which one it was. Good? Okay. Um, so anyways, the, the exciting thing for me about Sutherland Brook was how many different species we saw, um, just far and away more than anywhere else. And I promise you that I will get to our best images from Sunderland Brook, but I'm gonna hold off on those for just a second because I wanna go through a little bit of like, what does that mean, what we saw? So Sunderland Brook, we found the most animals overall and the most diversity of animals. And it's of note that at that location, they had the easiest access to water because of the brook. Uh, the brook has been, the riparian um, habitat around the brook has been restored for about 30 years. And because it's privately owned, they was, excuse me, there were the fewest people um, present at that site. At the Intervale Center, they saw, we saw the most squirrels and the most deer. So, you know, prize. Um, we also saw the most people and the Intervale is the biggest of the areas that we studied with probably the most varied habitat. In Pine Island, we saw the fewest animals and the least diversity of animals. Um, and it's also of note that that's where we had the narrowest forest, sort of the newest restoration projects, and our cameras were placed the farthest from consistent water sources. Um, so what does all of that mean? What, what do we learn from that? Like Alicia said, I love it when science tells us what we know in our hearts to be true. Water matters and restoration matters. Um, animals need access to habitat and they need access to water. Surprise. <laughs> Uh, and with that, I'm gonna go to our best images from Sunderland Brook. I don't know how many of you have dogs, um, but I do, and this behavior looks pretty familiar to me. This is a coyote on the banks of the Winooski. And then again, I don't know how many of you have cats, but I do, and this behavior looks pretty familiar to me too. And like most cats, this bobcat is slightly less compliant than the dog. So it'll be three videos instead of one. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Zoe for more questions. Thank you, Lena. That's great. And um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Zoe Richards, um, and I direct the Burlington Wildways Partnership, which is um, a partnership between the major public facing landowners in Burlington, Winooski Valley Park District, Burlington Parks Rec and Waterfront, Rock Point, and the Intervale Center. And um, I think true to my role there and my role here, I'll be facilitating a lot of questions and hopefully getting us all pointing in the right direction. Um, and uh, I hope if you have questions, you'll put them in the chat. I've tried to mine some questions. 
um, from the, uh, not, sorry, not in the chat, in the question and answer. Um, and I've mined some of the questions that appeared in the chat. Um, but I kind of, I think what I'm going to do is um, move between a few specific questions and then some more sort of general questions. Um, and I'll throw it out to the panel to answer. But um, we've had a number of questions um, about development in Burlington, the role of development. Um, uh, and I guess what I, I will also add there is maybe we could broaden out that discussion and I'll, I'll just leave it to the panelists to answer. Um, you know, cities are places where people live. And so development is one kind of growth threat. And I guess I would ask you, what are some of the other threats to wildlife within Burlington other than just habitat removal? Um, and I don't know who wants to take a first stab at that. Um, can I just note before we dive into that, that um, I, I don't want it to become a conversation of development versus habitat protection because development is important. There's a housing crisis in the city of Burlington and there's not enough housing to go around. Uh, and I just wanna acknowledge that because all development isn't bad, but development without intentional thoughtful planning towards our natural areas and our green spaces is what is bad. So they can, they can work together and work in tandem um, because housing is a right and uh, that, yeah. And I guess what I, I just want to add to that too, Rebecca, which is that I think it's easy to often say that the biggest urban threat is like to, is some sort of housing development, but there are also lots of things and, and, um, and I'll throw this out to the panel, things like dogs and off-leash dogs, which are a, a, a threat. And even when Lena was bringing up her interesting data, I wondered how much difference occurred because of dogs that were off leash and on leash where, you know, is it the people or is it the dogs? I mean, I don't have an answer to those questions. So I guess maybe we could have a, in an urban context, we could have a broader discussion about potential threats to wildlife. And I'm going to throw it to Alicia first. How about that? <laughs> Okay, I, I was uh, looking ahead at other questions, so I might sort of fold in another question with this answer, but I would definitely say the elephant in the room is dogs, and the elephant in the room is also cats. Um, you know, they, they do different things out there off leash, um, but they do impact wildlife. Um, cats are particularly um, deadly to fledging songbirds and other birds that are on the ground for a few days before they can fly. Um, and dogs, I think it's, some of them are capable of catching things. I think Sophie, you have some examples of things. Do you, do you wanna talk about like evidence of dogs actually directly impacting wildlife? Yeah, well, and, and this is just, you know, one anecdote, but fishers did attempt to den or a female fisher had several kits in Red Rocks a couple of years ago. and and one of them was killed by a dog. And there was a period in the springtime where people were noting fisher sightings and you know potentially aggressive fishers. And this was a mother trying to defend the area where her young were. And it, it can be an amazing time of year to have these closer sightings, but uh, it's not just off leash dogs necessarily, but even just the presence of those dogs in that habitat, whether it's you know the smell of them, the sound of them, can cause animals to flush, can, can stress them, right? So these are primarily animals that are communicating and uh, many of them sensing their world by smell. So even if your dog is perfectly behaved, there actually is, is an impact. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be walking dogs in Red Rocks, whether, uh, you know, like on leash, but uh, it's just, uh, it's a complicated thing when we start to take into consideration all of the wild species that we share the landscape with. Uh, and so it just merits a lot of careful thought. And I would say that this time of year is the time to be extra sensitive uh, to those young animals, all the denning animals right now. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Um, I think in addition to walking dogs on leash, being sure to pick up uh, dog scat is a nice idea. Um, you know, I went for a walk in Red Rocks right after all the snow melted and it was appalling. Um, just, you know, and I, I know it's cold and I know it can be hard to find, but it, you know, that it does have an impact on habitat. Um, and to move away from dogs for a minute, because we all love our canine pals, 
uh, I think invasive plants are another big concern that I have um, that just have a really terrible impact on habitat and on food sources um, for animals of all sizes and on you know nesting for birds and everything. So as we're talking about impacts on urban wildlife, I think that we would be remiss to not mention those plants too. And while we're still on this topic, I'd just like to bring up one other question. Uh, um, and I think I'm gonna actually also throw this one to Alicia, which is, um, Alicia, can you talk a little bit about, somebody was wondering what kind of habitat we can create in the city and how we can make sure that we continue to have connected habitats. Um, so. yeah. I, I, I do think that um, that's, uh, a really actually exciting piece uh, that's developing in Burlington and elsewhere actually around the country where uh, people like Doug Calame and other scientists are showing that, that by using our own yards um, and planting native plants, we can make a huge difference in the biodiversity in our city. And it starts with things, small things like insects and caterpillars and then those are eaten by birds. But it, but eventually, you know, if you think about, and, and Zoe, I know you're involved in this project at Champlain School uh, through a group that we're, we call Grow Wild. If you think about the lawned areas that we have uh, that are not used for recreation, it's kind of a habit that we're still mowing them. There are ways to start to create linkages by planting native plants between core habitats like Inglesby Brook and another patch of forest. And so I think, as we're kind of at ending, we're toward the end game a little bit of development in Burlington. I think the next step is restoration. You know, how do we get back um, some of the native plants that we've lost? And I think that's a work we're working on. I will say to people tuning in from South Burlington and maybe other places, I think conservation still has a really big role to play in some of our outlying cities. And so, you know, I, I actually am in favor of continuing to conserve wild lands. Um, and so I think I'll pause there, but I think those are, you know, two, two wings of the butterfly are protecting and connecting. And, you know, we're working at that from different angles. Um, I am going to, um, for the kids from Rutland who are watching, there um, is a question about um, how do you start tracking if you're a kid, Sophie? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have to say starting as a kid is a great idea and I'm jealous because I didn't start till I was about 25 years old. So you've got a great head start on me. Um, but uh, it can start right in your backyard. So, and especially in the snow season can be a great time, but at any time of year, think about track traps. Think about spots where if an animal were to walk through that area, they would leave their footprints behind. So as we come into mud season, think mud, think sandy shorelines, and you can go out looking for footprints there's tons of amazing uh, tracking guides uh, that are out there. So you can visit Amazon, the store, not the river, or your local bookstore and, and look to pick up a field guide about animal tracks. Um, and there's also actually a, a great website called naturetracking.com, uh, which is run by a really, really experienced tracker, one of my teachers named Jonah. He's down in Texas. So he doesn't often show pictures of tracks in the snow, but he has a whole guide that you can look up online for free uh, and look at his, his field guide to not just mammal tracks, but also bird tracks uh, and reptile and amphibian tracks too. Uh, and, and just start uh, looking through all the images of what different animal footprints look like, as well as some of their signs, right? Like their poop, their dens, their feeding sign. Uh, so yeah, looking towards some of those resources and we'll be sure to send those out. And then the next thing I recommend is getting good at taking good photos of tracks. So even if you have no idea what you're looking at or where to start, uh, if you see a mystery track or a mystery scat, try to take a photo of, of the track from straight overhead so that you're getting a straight on angle and then put down an object like a ruler. A ruler is ideal, but an object that you know the size of. So if I don't have a ruler on me, I'll put down a quarter or uh, you know any, anything else that somebody would recognize the size of. So I know what the scale of those tracks are. And then I take pictures that show a single track or several single tracks, the pattern of a group of tracks, and then the context. So like, what's the kind of habitat? What's the landscape like where those tracks are taking place? And just take as many notes and information as I can down in my field notebooks so that I can share that with another tracker. So I'm always happy to be one of those other trackers who gets those kinds of questions, but maybe you can find some in your local community too uh, that you can ask about the tracks that you're finding. 
Thanks, Sophie. Um, I wanted to put a question out there about coyotes because there were a couple of coyote questions. Somebody asked, um, are we seeing coyotes or coy dogs? And also um, a curiosity about whether coyotes scent mark like fox do. Maybe that's a Sophie question. <laughs> um, yeah, so all of these animals are scent marking is, is the quick answer to that question. Uh, they, coyote leave a musky kind of smell. It's not like the skunky smell of red fox and it's probably not even as strong as, as gray fox uh, scent, but they are absolutely uh, out there scent marking. And coyotes will be especially diligent about leaving those scent marks, which really just means peeing, right? And leaving that strong scent from their scent glands at the edges of their territory. So you may see a concentration of scent marks if you were to try to track it, or if you were you know, able to actually see them all or smell them all, you might see a concentration where one coyote territory neighbors or borders on another one. So was there a second part to that question, Zoe? There was the coyote versus coy dog question. Ah, um, well, I'm gonna give a short answer for now, but it's it's funny because it gets into the idea of what do we consider a separate species? So our canines, including wolves, coyotes, dogs can interbreed and have young together. Uh, and and that can happen. I, I'm not sure about any incidents or you know specific examples of that in Vermont, but it's just interesting that that, that can happen. But usually coyotes tend to keep to themselves and breed with other coyotes. Don't they have kind of a different sort of cycling of when they breed? Well, the wild canines only come into heat once a year, right? So they're only able to breed once a year and they have a really small window, whereas our domestic dogs, uh, if they're not spayed or neutered, can breed throughout the year, which is why you can go and, and find puppies at any time of year. I, I think one concern that, that people interested in uh, conserving wild animals have with the term koi dog is it's, it can be used to kind of denigrate the animal and it's not worthy of protection. So just to be clear, we know that most of the coyotes in Vermont are coyotes. Yeah, and, and actually normally I hear the question from the other direction, I have people ask me about koi wolves because our Eastern coyotes are larger than the Western coyotes and they've only come out this way since about the 1950s uh, because wolves were extirpated, right? Locally extinct uh, in this area. And there is this niche that opened up for these coyotes to come in. And, and as they made their way East uh, through Canada, like around the Great Lakes, uh, there was some interbreeding with wolves and so our, some of our coyotes here have a little bit of wolf genetics in them, and uh, for that reason, they are larger uh, than their Western counterparts, but they're still very much Eastern coyotes. So I see that we're at two o'clock. We have some more good questions, I think, that we would like to get answered. Rebecca, Catherine, how do you want to proceed? I think maybe our panelists would be willing to stay around for a few more minutes to ask, um, to answer some more questions that we have queued up. Um, but I also want to be uh, mindful of people's hour. Yeah, why don't we um, take about, about 10 more minutes and if you would like to stay on, we would love to have you stay on. And if you need to go, get on with your day, we understand that too. Um, that sounds good to everyone. All the Great, so why don't we take you know about 10 more minutes of questions if that works um, and um, Thank you for those who joined us. And if you'd like to stick around to hear a few more question answers, I'm gonna, um, I, I'm gonna ask all three of you to answer this interesting question, um, which was, in a general sense, what are the big unanswered questions these days about animal movement through and around Burlington? And maybe we'll just, um, let, let's start with Lena and, um, and then we'll just, I'm gonna ask Lena, Sophie, and Alicia to each answer that because maybe you'll have different answers. Um, sure. So in a general sense, what are the unanswered questions? Um, for me, I would really like to sort of parse out what exactly it is that impacts animal movement. Like, you know, I have a theory that access to water and restoration is important, but I would like to know that in more detail. If there's like a minimum size hedgerow or a minimum age forest that is useful. I think that that would be good to know. Sort of getting getting really, really specific like that is sort of where 
where my mind goes when I think about kind of what is the next question that I would like to explore. Great. Sophie, what about you? <laughs> yeah, and I'm sorry if I repeat anything because Lena cut out for me. I have a slow internet connection here, but uh, I, honestly, I, I think it, it feels to me like there's more unanswered than there is answered. Like, you know, without uh, dismissing any of the information that's been gathered, you know, both the kind of broad picture and the detailed studies of certain areas, there's still so much that we don't know. And, uh, and so just one example that comes to mind for me is uh, how successful are these animals actually being at reproducing in Burlington? So I gave the example, you know, a fisher making an attempt in Red Rocks and, and one year, um, you know, some of those young being disturbed by dogs or at least one of them being killed. Even though we have all these wildlife present in Burlington, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily rearing young who are then successfully dispersing to their own territories, whether that's another spot in Burlington or beyond it. So I'm really curious to know, uh, yeah, what's going on specifically uh, for those wildlife beyond just, uh, you know, who's present on the land. And, and that's a tricky thing to study, uh, you know, short of getting in there and yeah, radio collaring or using some, you know, DNA testing methods and just keeping a really, really careful eye on those animals. Yeah, I mean, I would just say not to get into the deep ecology of all this stuff, but I think, you know, at least in birds and many animals, we use that source sink idea where, you know, our, our, do we have wild, it is a curiosity about whether wild, life in Burlington is sort of a sink. You know, they're living here and they're surviving here, but they, for a lot of reasons, they don't reproduce effectively. And that, I agree with you, it'd be very interesting to know, are we, are, are do we have animals, but they're, they're not persisting. <laughs> um, they're only persisting because new animals keep coming in, Phil. Um, Alicia, I'm gonna throw that question to you too, if you wanted to see what you thought. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the big unanswered questions for me is what will do we have as residents of Burlington to make things work better for the animals around us? And that may include putting in better culverts or more culverts under highways. You know, as we begin to learn through observation where they're crossing and moving around the city, and we want to think with things like bobcats, we have to think of a larger area than Burlington itself. So can we work together as people? Can we work together as multiple cities and uh, suburbs, you know, to make quarters um, more functional for wildlife? And, you know, how, how, do we, how, how do we buy into that? Yeah, do we have the will to keep our dogs on a leash? You know, <laughs> many of us are dog owners. It's hard, it's challenging. Um, I, I wanted to uh, throw out another question, which was about um, uh, somebody had asked about sort of seeing negative perceptions of spotted wildlife on, um, you know, like on Front Porch Forum. There's a, you know, watch out, there's a fisher in the neighborhood, um, repeated many times over in many different places. And I was just wondering if people had thoughts about how to sort of address that. I think that's kind of what the question was getting at. Um, uh, you know, do you, do you all have thoughts on how do you deal with that personally, you know, <laughs> when you encounter that? I'd be happy to jump in on that one. And, and first off, just to say that, you know, as a tracker, I'm always looking for evidence. So I find that in some of those reports, people can be really quick to jump to conclusions. Like they heard that fishers are scary or that coyotes may be around and therefore that must be the animal that bothered their chickens last night. Um, when, uh, you know, the evidence and, and tracking that I've seen has revealed that raccoons or opossums are more likely to be getting into the chicken coop, say in the old North End or something like that. Uh, and so, yeah, I just, uh, I try to encourage and it can be really hard because people can really latch onto those narratives. I just try to promote uh, a sense of inquiry and curiosity and investigation rather than just, you know, labeling a certain carnivore as a, as a culprit or a danger. Uh, so, you know, what is the truth of, yeah, who's eating who or, uh, you know, who's actually roaming where? Good question. I think, I think just to pick up on that, uh, Zoe, I sometimes reach out directly to people who post things like that. And, and sometimes it's just to encourage what you're describing, Sophie, like, oh, I saw a fox and they would bring in the cats or whatever. You know, I, I'll just say, oh, did you see a fox? Was it red? Was it gray? And I'll send them two different pictures and, you know, just get people realizing there's not a sort of generic 
<laughs> approach to take to wild animals, you know, that it's really better to learn a little more. Yeah. That, that said, you know, I do sometimes worry that we're one rabies outbreak away from, you know, having a different relationship with foxes. Um, but my, my hope is that we will avoid that. Great. Well, maybe we have time for um, one more question. Um, and uh, somebody um, threw out the question about that they own some property and they have fox, coyote, fisher, and bobcat all on there. And they were just curious about I, I think it's an interaction question. Do, do they have separate territories? Do they share territories? Do they interact with each other? Do they interfere with each other? And what do we know about that? How do they influence each other? If you have any ideas about that. Yeah, anybody wanna jump in on that one? I mean, absolutely, they're all aware of each other and their territories are overlapping. So like when we talk about an animal scent marking, they're not just leaving their scent for their own species, right? They come and investigate uh, each other's smells and sign. And I've come across the trail of a spot where a fisher, say, has come across a fox scat and scent post and then ended up rolling all over it and leaving their own scent there too. Uh, and I don't know exactly what the content of that message was, but it's you know such an interesting thing to see those interactions. Um, I think this is another of the big mysteries though. So, uh, you know, foxes, it's, it, or it's, you know, there's potential that a fox would hunt a fisher. Uh, th those like top carnivores are, you know, they're kind of middle sized as far as like what exists in the whole country. But when we think of coyotes, bobcats and fishers at the top, I'm not totally sure actually who's kind of subordinate to who. They have different strategies and lifestyles. And I think they're actually able in most cases to, um, to share and kind of, you know, fill different roles. Uh, in the landscape, but there could be some aggression between them. But then, uh, you know, there's there's so much mystery to the kinds of interactions that they can have too. And one great example is a, a viral video that was going around uh, in the fall. And I think it was a hunter who was in a tree stand in Pennsylvania who caught video of a fox and a fisher looking like they were playing a game of tag. And, you know, it's possible that one was kind of like teasing or maybe baiting the other, like maybe one of them was considering the other as food, which would be the fish are likely considering the fox's food, but it really looked like they were playing. And uh, and so there's just so much mystery, I think, to those types of interactions that are going on. Yeah, tell, tell us one about the coyote and the badger too. That was, that, was it going through the culvert? Yeah, well, a coyote and badger are known, and not that we have badgers in, in our area, but they're known to, to team up and hunt together. And uh, the badgers will, will dig up prey and then the coyote will lie in wait at the like exit, another you know entrance to a burrow system to catch the prey. And I think the coyote may have the, the better end of the bargain. Mm -hmm. um, but my colleagues, Ahiga Snyder and Tanya Diamond in California caught video of a coyote coaxing a badger into a culvert, like buddies going off to hunt together. And uh, yeah, just so cool to see, uh, to get those little snapshots of those interactions on camera. Yeah, it, and I, I have to wonder if, um, you know, as we leave wildlife with less habitat, you know, if they tend to have to overlap more. And, and also, uh, I was really struck one time when someone told me that foxes and coyotes and bobcat, they all have eyes adjusted to being out in the daylight. They're not really designed to be nighttime creatures, but we've kind of forced them into that lifestyle because they're avoiding us, you know, in our... Yeah, and, and that's a good point that, I mean, even though they're, you know, they have ways of sharing the landscape that they can be competing for the same food sources, especially in a, a fragmented landscape where there's maybe not as much space for them to roam. So like one example of that is that Red foxes tend to avoid coyotes. They, they'll occupy spaces in between coyote territories often uh, because coyotes will chase after them and kill them. And that's not because coyotes are looking at red foxes as a food source, but because they view them as competitors for the same foods. And Zoe, one thing that I would add um, would be to encourage that person with all those animal sightings on their property to put out a game camera, see what they're doing, right? This is, it's, it's an easy way to gather information. Um, and I would certainly be curious to see what you find. Super fun and rewarding too, I think, getting having a game cam, especially when, for folks who are not as good as um, picking up tracks like me. Um, 
Uh, I we're, we're getting close to the end, but I'm just going to um, ask, I'm going to put out one more question. I think this will be our final question. Um, and that is around deer in Burlington. And I, and I guess I would encourage our uh, crew of panelists to sort of speak more widely on deer. Somebody was asking whether deer are overabundant in, um, in uh, Burlington and whether or not, and I think we could maybe speak to potential overabundance and why we might have it too um, uh, in Vermont or the Champlain Valley. Can I, can I throw that to you, Alicia? Sure. I mean, people who study forests are becoming increasingly concerned that in certain places, we're not seeing the next generation of trees. Um, we're not seeing young trees coming up in the understory. And a lot of that is being attributed to overbrowsing by deer. A um, couple of factors. Well, <laughs> it's hard to know how to go deeply into this topic, Zoe. It's a it's a it's a complicated one. But but probably well, we know that the loss of our top level predators like wolves and catamounts have contributed to the problem. Um, we know that. Uh, it's that hunting is on the decline and, and also that maybe we haven't quite hit the mark in terms of how many deer we think the landscape can support. Um, I mean that, so the concern is they're eating our understory and we're worried that it might lead to some forests to kind of collapse on themselves by not having the next generation of trees or herbs um, growing there. What, what we've seen in Burlington, I think Lena is most evident in the Intervale. Do you have anything to add of what you're hearing down there? Just more, yes, what you said, um, you know, sort of the understory isn't exist, is, is not visible. Um, we've started to see deer eating things that they don't usually like, uh, which I think indicates that they're running, uh, sort of running out of other options. Um, so like when deer start browsing knotweed, it's because they don't have anything better to eat. Uh, so, and, and we're starting to see that. Um, so yeah, I think that's, and I, and as Alicia said, the, you know, decline in hunting, um, when people post that, that private lands are not available for hunting, that also leads, and more people are doing that, that leads to a decline in hunting that leads to more deer. Um, and the removal of their predators. So yeah, just reiterating everything Alicia said, there's also true at the intervale. Sophie, do you know if um, in the sort of where you have some more top level predators where you are right now in the Pacific Northwest, is there less of a deer problem? I also think it's a climate change problem too, but. Um... Yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I mean, in short, I don't really know yeah, the answer to that question, but it is maybe a little bit more of a complicated picture here. And, and also, I live in an area now, I'm in Seattle, but just on the outskirts of Seattle, because there aren't really deer right in the city. It's a little too built up right here in Seattle. I've like seen tracks once in my local park. Yeah. So they sometimes come through in the breeding season. Uh, but if you go just outside of the city, you come into cougar country. And so, uh, you know, you can find deer and elk and cougars and black bears. So there's, there's still those big, uh, yeah, big top predators that are feeding on deer. And, and I think still there are a lot of deer and there is a lot of browsing going on, but I, I'm not sure that it's to the same degree as in the Northeast, but I just don't really know. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, thank you. Cougars is always a good way to end um, <laughs> an event like this. Um, and I think, uh, I think we'll just give it, a, we'll call it right now because we're at uh, 216 and I'm so grateful that everybody could join us. Rebecca, Catherine, do you have anything? Um, we're, we're really grateful to um, Vermont Land Trust for sponsoring this and getting us all together. And, um, and it's exciting to have it be spring to get back out there. Uh, thanks all for tuning in. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>